Um, but we're going to talk today about uh, just gardening and small spaces. Uh, a lot of you all probably have a lot of experience in this already, and maybe you're just trying to pick up a, a thing or two. You may teach me something. So I, I really want to, you all to participate if you can. And if you've got other ways of doing it, please let us know. Please, please let me know. All right. So as you know, we can grow plants in a lot of places. Uh, our traditional garden, of course, is, is you know in the ground. Uh, but there's a lot of different places we can grow them. Um, if those of you who aren't familiar with uh, the picture on the left, that's what we call a cold frame. Um, it's just something where you can either harden some plants off or, or grow in the winter time. Uh, like right now, I've got some kale and, and spinach in there right now, and it's, it's doing pretty good. But uh, we can grow in a lot of different places. And I uh, just want to let y'all know, this is my garden at home. Uh, that, that's a joke. <laughs> Uh, this is this is Monticello and you know in the ground um, we can grow anything right we can grow just about anything uh, we really would like to have good soil well-drained soil maybe not as much clay clay type soil but we can still have a decent garden even in clay soils uh, we do want to have it close to water and if you all have the same relationship to uh, tillers and things like that that I do I really don't want to go near those if possible so I've adopted uh, the not really a no well raised bed gardening is a no till method, um, but I just don't want to deal with that. So it's very easy to make a raised guard raised bed garden and not ever have to deal with uh, power tools. I will tell you before I go on, this is a, an image heavy sort of image heavy. So I'm going to run through a lot of slides fairly quick. If you need to go back and look, you're you're welcome to go to the um, website and you can take a look at the slides a little bit better there. So we can grow anything in containers um, or, or anything in, in raised beds. Um, this is a picture, as you see, from just last, well, last month, but I've actually harvested that broccoli uh, around the 1st of February. So we can, we can grow anything in a container, just about. Um, we can grow blueberries and strawberries, things we consider to be um, perennials. But vegetables are, are pretty easy to grow in containers or raised bed areas. And when we talk about containers, we, we always think about the plastic, the terracotta, you know, the metals, woods, those kind of things. But a container is anything that will hold media and grow your plant. So, you know, that person shoes is a, is a container, although, you know, it's not something we would generally use for, for vegetables, but that's not to say you can't. Um, a lot of people like to upcycle and recycle plastic things. So you can see that, that picture down there, um, bottom center. You know, that to me is a watering nightmare, but uh, they've got a little irrigation looks like set up ready to go. So uh, there's a lot of different ways we can grow vegetables in particular in containers. And here's a guy who just wanted to, he, he didn't have a garden and he lined his driveway with five gallon pots and grew all his tomatoes down his driveway. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, uh, we think of containers themselves as being really good for uh, things like lettuces and herbs and things like that, but uh, there are varieties now out there, vegetable cultivars, that are suited to small spaces or container plants, like that salad bush, All America selections over there. So um, you may not get to grow, you know, the same plants or the same cultivars you wanted to grow in a traditional garden, but you could. There's equivalents that will work fine in containers. And an, a plug for uh, the Home Vegetable Gardening in Kentucky publication. It's excellent. It has a whole uh, section in there on growing more with less space. And it's got varieties in there that are very good for containerized areas or at least small areas. And we also have the, uh, the publication Gardening in Small Spaces where a lot of this information came from, plus my own experience, I guess. Um, but it has everything from the media, um, some stuff on um, um, the spacing of your plants in, in something like a raised bed. They've got square foot gardening, which we'll, we're going to talk about a little bit. I'm hoping to, to get through this fairly quickly. So uh, we're going to go through it quick. So we won't maybe not hit every point that I want to make, but it's even got plans for that. And then it's even got um, uh, the, the relative cost of different types of material that you make your bed with. So check that uh, publication out. It's ID two, what, 48, 68? I can't read it. Anyway, um, it's a good publication. 
All right, so let's talk about raised beds. Um, as I said, we can, we can grow about any fruit or vegetable in these kind of uh, areas. You, one of the main things you get with a raised bed is you improve your drainage, which if you do have clay soil, you understand that that's kind of a big deal. You, you need to, to have good drainage to grow most vegetables. Um, it will warm up quicker too. Uh, so that is a nice, maybe not, it won't be significantly so, but it's still enough that maybe you can get in a week earlier or something like that. And I put easier to work in with some question marks because as you can see, this is a, the picture shows a six inch bed. That is still not very easy to work in. Your back is, is still bending over almost all the way to the ground. But I'll talk about why we use six inches uh, here at the office in, in just a second when we talk about square foot gardening. Um, we have some, now, now I would argue that this is very easy to work in. You can sit your fanny down on that top uh, board and you can sit there and do your work in the garden. So uh, if you're thinking about raising the bed up to maybe 30 inches or more, you know, that's, that's gonna be significant for your back. As you get older, you need to think about that. Um, because your back is, is a very valuable thing and, and leaning over all the time is not good. And then I love the guy from Australia called Self-Sufficient Me. He is a hoot to watch. He's got, he's a, you can grow, you know, he has this video on growing in pallets. Um, he's got a lot of stuff growing in there, a lot. And then here's just some more pictures of our six inch beds here at the office. Um, they're three foot wide and about 15 foot long. That's not a big deal, but um, you can reach across them pretty easy. Okay, here's some more of the beds again with kale in it, some cover crops. You know, these are still beds where you wanna improve your soil. So cover crops is not a bad thing to do. Um, and then I get a picture at the UK Arboretum from some years ago, uh, but they are using 12 inch high beds there, which would be a little bit easier on your back. And then here's some some very some hard scapey raised beds that are nice. Um, so uh, to me, that's more for show the Atlantic Botanical Garden down there, but it's still a nice uh, illustration of what you can do in a raised bed. And this was a field day I went to down in McCreary County. And uh, this couple was an older couple and they fixed this very regimented uh, raised bed area. I mean, it, it was great. It's about 12 inches tall, but you can see in the pictures they have, they have all the things they need for trellising. They have supports there like little PVC pipes so they can, they can put some plastic or some sort of row cover over top to protect them. They've got irrigation. They've got everything they need right there. Uh, I'm not sure what the side is made of. It looks like it may be some siding from a home or something like that. I'm not 100% sure, but that is a nice, nice raised bed area there. And then we, as I said, we do need to keep improving the soil that we put in these beds. So, you know, in the fall, rake leaves onto it, um, break down your fall decorations and put straw over top of it, add compost every year, you know, do those types of things to improve it. All right, but we do need to talk about the soil because when you, when you have a raised bed, that now becomes pretty valuable real estate. And you want it to be the best uh, soil that, that will support the plants that you're gonna grow. So um, I'll just throw a few recipes out here to you. Um, our UK publication, which um, I did find it. It is ID 248, the gardening in small spaces here. It says to use less than 25% regular garden soil and 75% other organic amendments. So that could be peat, it could be core, it could be compost, it could be straw, it could be anything that's, that's uh, an organic, is organic matter. Um, according to this publication, it does say to avoid using more than 75% compost due to the nutrient load. Um, I don't know, you all may have some different um, uh, experiences with that, so, I'll leave that up to you on that, but this is what our publication says. Um, Joe Lample, a lot of you may know him. Uh, I can't remember the name of his show, but anyway, um, he's, he's using 50% garden soil, 25% compost, and 25% some other organic amendment again. Um, and then we have Mel's mix, which is the mix that is um, 
the recipe in square foot gardening, that is one third peat or core, one third vermiculite and one third of a compost blend. All right, now let me, I'm not gonna blow some of y'all's minds, you may have heard of this, but if you're gonna have beds that are more than 30 inches or so, which, which makes it very, very comfortable for you to work in, you may, you, you know, those, those, uh, uh, those recipes are, could be kind of expensive to fill up 30 inches worth. So a lot of times we'll say, well, let's put some, some bulky organic matter on the bottom, meaning logs, um, and then some other coarse things on top of that. And then, because because vegetables don't need, but, you know, 18, 12 to 18 inches of, of rooting area. So we can afford to just kind of use filler on the bottom and then put the good stuff on the top. Um, those of you who, who not heard of hugel culture it is a german word that means hill culture and <clears throat> there's if you if you look it up on the internet you'll find all sorts of things on it i encourage you to do that but the um it's kind of the the picture on the lower left there sort of shows what we're talking about you put really tough woody material on the bottom sometimes digging a hole out and then you're layering it with uh, more as you go toward the edge more finished products. Um, <clears throat> so that's supposed to break down and supply the nutrients to your crop. But this is a, I think this is a pretty good technique if you're going to use very tall or taller raised beds than say six inches or 12 inches. All right, so uh, I'm going to switch just to square foot gardening. Um, this is a this is a book back in the I guess it was the 60s or 70s that came out. Mel Bartholomew did it. This is his second edition, but he does have a third edition now, which I do not have. But the principles in the second edition, <clears throat> which still hold true in in the third edition, is that you're going to use 20% of the space to grow the same amount of produce that you would in traditional rows. That's pretty that's pretty big. To me, that means you're not going to have to weed near as much, and that's very much the truth. Second principle is you only need six inches of the mix to grow plants in. Now, I've got a daughter who, when she was a child, really, really small, she loved carrots. Now, you know, I couldn't grow an eight inch carrot in, in five or six inches of mix, obviously. So there are some techniques we can use to do this. But for most part, he, he argued that you could use six inches of mix. And then the third principle was a four by four square where you can easily reach across. Most people are now taking that further to be four by whatever, as long as you can reach across from one side to the other, you can tend the, the entire thing. And here, I'm not going to go through this, but here's just a list of, uh, again, according to his recipe of how many per square foot that you can grow in that space. Um, it is important to make the squares. That is a requirement to be a true square foot garden is to make the squares. So you can use anything really, but um, it's important to do that so you you can conceptualize in your mind what, what amount of produce you can put in there. All right, so let's get to, uh, we're talking about square foot gardening. This goes for just about anything else is, is the materials you need to make the beds. Um, you know, you can use the, the just plain old untreated lumber. That's fine, uh, but it will need replacement pretty quickly, probably within three years. Um, the plastic or recycled lumber, that works very well too. And um, it does cost quite a bit more to begin with, but it will last forever. Concrete blocks, very simple to come by a lot of times and uh, are, are gonna be sturdy and stay there for a long time. And some people even use straw bales. Uh, that to me is not the best use of a straw bale, but hey, do whatever, whatever you feel like. Um, and when we talk about the untreated lumber, we do want to make sure, <clears throat> excuse me, that uh, if you if you have the, the luxury of choosing what type of lumber to use, you know, you want to use that rot resistant stuff like a bald cypress, sassafras, black locust, cedar, those kind of things. Um, and I will tell you that we that Kentucky State does have a, an info sheet on what wood is safe to use in my garden. So if you're wondering about, you know, recycling some wood from that you don't know, you know, you don't know if it's been pressure treated or how old it is or whatever, 
you may want to look at this uh, fact sheet. <clears throat> All right, so in square foot gardening method, <clears throat> we do have th this one to one to one mixture by volume of <clears throat> peat moss, compost, and vermiculite. Mel's mix requires, again, in his book, this is the recipe, different manufacturers, different origins of the compost. So don't just buy the same brand, you know, four bags of the same brand. Um, he wants you to find several different types of compost, whether it be mushroom compost, cow manure compost, whatever it is. Um, so to keep that in mind. I will tell you that when I use the same compost, the same bag, I had four identical bags from the same, same source. Um, I, I did find that my pH was a little higher than it probably should have been. The peat moss didn't counteract it. So um, again, just keep that in mind. Um, a weed mat is very important. You will have weeds, especially if you put them out in your, your, uh, just your grass area, your turf area. So be sure to put down a weed mat. And I would argue that that's probably not the best method. That picture down there, I would say that you probably want to go out beyond the edges of your square foot garden. And again, just some pictures. There are some potatoes, some um, fingerling potatoes. Um, there's some, some garlic planted in there. Um, there's some fall coal crops, spinach, kale, um, again, but do notice that my weed mat came outside of the bed. You really do wanna keep that weed free out there because you will find fescue will come right up in that. Bermuda grass will come right up in that. <clears throat> and potatoes, um, he recommends four per square. Um, there's also a method he calls cut, cut that you make a you make an extra box, like the picture on the the bottom left shows. You make an extra box. He call a box. He calls that a high rise or a top hat. And so basically, you're planting in the bottom, but then as you to get more potatoes and get more um, volume of soil for those potatoes to grow, you uh, build a box that goes over those squares, fill that up, and so you basically have 12 inches of growing space instead of of uh, just six. And, uh, you know, the same way with carrots, you'd fill up those boxes, that, that extra box, and you have 12 inches of growing space there. And I did a little comparison of, of some potatoes in the grow bags versus the square foot garden, just so you can see what it looks like. Um, I got better yield out of the square foot garden, the potatoes in the bags just got too hot. But anyway, just, just so you know, it's a pretty good method of growing potatoes. And if you do have critters, you know, he has a he has a whole section on how to build this. You know, you know, you take a little piece of wood and, and put some chicken wire on it and you can lift that right off, especially if your crops are, are kind of tall in there. Um, there's all sorts of ways. And then trellising. I mean, you can go online and Pinterest and all these different places and find all different methods of trellising in these things. Um, you will need to trellis, you know, some things depending on what you're growing. But uh, it's just amazing what you can find. And people are very inventive, much more inventive than I would be. And I did find this on, uh, on the gardener supply company. They had a, a garden planner, a square foot garden planner. Um, the last time I looked though, a couple, three days ago, this was taken down. So I don't know if it's back up, but it will kind of help you visualize your plants. Um, I thought it was kind of handy when I did it, but it's, it's no longer there. So I apologize, maybe they'll bring it back. Okay, I'm gonna switch gears to lasagna gardening. Um, there's a whole book on it, just like Mel's book um, by Patricia Lanza. You can find it in uh, probably every library in the state. Um, but basically this is sheet composting and making your bed out of organic materials that you may have around the house. Um, to me, this is one of the benefits of lasagna gardening over over square foot gardening is square foot gardening <clears throat> relies on store-bought materials and this one relies just on whatever you happen to have. So uh, what you're doing is you're not, you're just layering different types of organic matter into a mound and you make that mound, you know, 18 inches tall or so. And uh, if you do this in the, in the winter or back in the fall, by spring it should be ready to, to plant. Um, if you wait until like right now to do it, or even uh, maybe even a little bit later, um, they say you can water it and cover it with plastic and let it cook a little bit and that you'll have something to plant into. But basically you're just, you're just uh, 
using greens and browns that you would normally put in a compost pile, um, cardboard, you know, newspapers, um, grass clippings, just what, whatever you might have. So um, I think it's, it's a pretty good method. The only thing is, again, keep the weeds controlled around wherever you start building this. Please <laughs> keep the weeds down. Um, and again, you can put an edging around it using anything you might have. Uh, and that's, that's one of mine from home that I used whatever I had lying around. So I love this method, it's very cheap. Okay, quickly, quickly, this is a whole presentation unto itself. I wanted to quickly go over straw bale gardening as well. So let's get into this, um, I'll skip that. And uh, what, is, what it is, is you're taking a straw bale and you're conditioning the bale so that um, it starts the rotting process on the inside. And um, then you're planting with whatever you want to plant with. So um, as far as what kind of straw bales to, to buy, you know, you can use anything really. Um, uh, wheat, of course, is most common. Uh, do not use hay. And I say, you can always use hay. I don't know why I said that, but anyway, Hey, you want to stay away from because it's going to have a lot of weed seeds, but you want straw. Um, so these are fairly, to me, they're pretty cheap. Um, and you, we prefer to use, uh, if you have the choice, which a lot of times you will not, but you want something, uh, the, the twine that's keeping that straw bale together to not be juked, something that's going to rot. You want to be some sort of poly twine that's going to be there forever. And some of the advantages are, you know, they're, they're a little taller, so you're going to be much happier. Your back's going to be a whole lot happier. Um, it isn't permanent exactly, but um, once you get these bales wet, you know, you don't want to move them, but you can move them around a little bit to see which site um, is better for you. And then after you're done with the bales, you can actually use them uh, back as compost or, or mulch. So it's a great way to recycle everything. Um, so the advantages are you don't have to dig, you don't have to have a tiller, you can even place them on pavement if that's the only sun that you've got, um, less weeding for sure, and you're not going to have soil borne disease issues like you might uh, in a traditional, traditional garden. Now some of the disadvantages are um, watering, you know, all these methods that we're talking about, not just straw bales, but they're all going to, you're, you're going to need to be close to water. These things are going to are well drained there for a reason, but you, so you have to have a way to, to irrigate. Um, you do have to, another disadvantage is fertility. You know, these straw bales and to some degree, whatever you fill up your other beds with, you know, may, you may have to supply all the nutrients that that plant might need. Uh, so, so keep that in mind. Um, and then basically, you know, if you're going to have a whole lot of these, these might be run, get a little expensive, but I know around here we can get straw bales for five bucks, four bucks, something like that. Um, all right, let me fly through that as well. <clears throat> all right, um, so when you place your bales, you're going to place it, you know, how you carry them with the, with the twine, you're actually not going to put that side up, you're going to, you're going to turn it over. So the, the cut ends of the, the straw are sticking up. Um, so your, your twine's gonna be going around this way instead of on top. Um, when you get them wet, they get heavy. So be sure you have them where you want them. And again, for most of our vegetables and stuff, we're, we want as much full sun as we can get. Um, <clears throat> I'll quickly go through this, but you can go back and read all this, but you're conditioning the bales uh, using moisture and ammonium sulfate, ammonium nitrate, something like that, urea. Um, and there's a, there's a recipe for you do so many days, three days of this, three days of this. Um, and then by day 11 or 12, you're, you're ready to plant. And I will tell you, these things get hot. That picture right there is of my bales here at the office and they were running 116, 18 degrees. You cannot plant into that. You have to wait till it, it gets down below 100 and then your little plant roots will be a whole lot happier. So it generally takes, you know, around two weeks, maybe less. 
And the way you plant into these is you either make divots and holes and put your transplants in for large seeded things like uh, cucumbers or squash. Uh, you can actually make the divots and put a little potting mix in there along with them. Um, so that, you know, that, that is pretty easy to do, honestly. Um, there's other methods to plant where you put um, uh, some sort of seed starting mix on top of the bale. And then that way, you know, things like lettuce or, or carrots that you might want to plant, you can just sprinkle those seeds on top. And let's see if there's anything in here. Let's keep going. Uh, the, there's no real planting guide that you can find online. There's people that just have ideas about how many to plant per bale. So here's some guidelines that you can use or, or not. <laughs> if you find something else works, by all means do it. Um, and then here's some examples of just what people have done with these bales. Uh, potatoes, you know, melons, corn, sweet corn, you know, that's eh. That, that you'd have to have a whole lot of bales to make that work, but hey, more power to them. Now, <clears throat> if we do put in, uh, if we do plant some top heavy plants, like some uh, even determinant tomatoes, but indeterminates for sure, you're gonna have to have a way to get them upright and keep them upright. So there's all sorts of methods to do that using, using stakes, using whatever materials you might have. Um, you can see on the left, that's pretty elaborate over there. <clears throat> but that's going to keep them upright, and you're going to use the same methods to kind of tie them up that you would in a traditional garden um, or, or get tomato cages or something like that. <clears throat> Just more pictures. And then watering, you know, uh, try to use drip irrigation on all plants, uh, in my opinion. Um, there, there's, I, I used to, for, for trees, I know I, I would put down a gallon milk jugs with a small hole in the bottom, but you know, you could use that even in this method as well. Uh, and uh, that last bolt there, it says, you know, it'd be very difficult to overwater plants. And that is true. This stuff does run, you know, the water does run right through them. And I won't talk a little bit about, much about this, but just understand that in these straw bales, you know, you may have some micronutrient things come up or even macronutrient things come up. So just be aware, you may have to, you may still have to fertilize these. And then gr the great thing about these is there's no weeds. You might have, if you know, if you've got wheat straw or rye straw, you might have a little bit of that coming up, but it's, it's very minimal. It's very, very easy. Um, it's basically weed free. Of course, Pests are still going to be a problem. <clears throat> so you will have to monitor your plants for that. And uh, just again, reiterating full sun for most of our vegetable plants. But if you do have some things you want to you know, grow in the shade, be sure to situate your bales where, you, where they are going to have the right conditions. You can do season extension with straw bales. You can do season extension with raised beds too. It's not, it's, you know, you just, just have a way to drape uh, some cloth over top of things. So uh, you can do everything you can with other, other uh, with straw bales that you can with other methods. Um, <clears throat> so usually these, these bales don't hold up more than a year. Just be aware of that. You will have to purchase them every year. And just some more pictures. There's some melons, it looks like. I'm not sure what that is. Potatoes, maybe. Uh, there's some cukes. Some, beans and peppers all grown in there. And I don't know if the strawberry tower on the left works. It's a great picture though, isn't it? <laughs> so I included it just so you, there's possibilities out there. And again, just a lot of pictures to show you, but you can go back and look at these. And I certainly encourage flowers to be intermixed in, whether it be a, a regular raised bed or straw bales. And look at that before and after. I thought that was pretty impressive. All right, I have flown through that, um, but I wanted to leave time for, for questions if I could. And again, you can review anything you like uh, uh, with the, with the um, slides that are posted on the website. So thank you all.